This is the MyHeart.net podcast. This show is produced by Dr. Philip Johnson in conjunction with VitalEngine.com. Please welcome your host, Dr. Elaine Bouchard of Cardiology Specialist of Birmingham, Alabama at St. Vincent's Medical Center, part of Ascension. Well, welcome to our podcast and discussion on a new breakthrough in the treatment of heart failure. With me, my co-host is Dr. Mustafa Ahmed, Director of the Interventional and, and the Structural Program at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. And our guest this week is Dr. Jason Guichard with Prisma Health. He is Director of the Advanced Heart Failure Program in South Carolina. Gentlemen, welcome. As we know, um, heart failure is very common. We calculate that about one in five people will develop heart failure during their lifetime. It is estimated that approximately uh, 63 million people are affected with heart failure worldwide. The increased burden of heart failure is due primarily to aging population. We have a predominance of heart failure as a cause of hospitalization, for example, in patients older than 65 years. Heart failure comprise an array of category of uh, patients that are mostly um, uh, identified by their symptoms, which consist of uh, shortness of breath, fatigue, weakness, as well as swelling in their ankles, and their ejection fraction. And you can find a good article in myheart.net on heart function, including ejection fraction. But normally, the heart pumps approximately 50 to 60% of the blood with each contraction. With heart failure, that capacity is reduced. And with patients with low ejection fraction, we see ejection fraction that are lower than 40%. We have a group of patients that have um, either mid-range or preserve ejection fraction. It usually, the ejection fraction is calculated at 40% or higher. The prevalence of preserve or heart failure with uh, normal ejection fraction is increasing, actually, with 65% of heart failure uh, revealing ejection fraction greater than 40%. So how do we prevent heart failure? Um, obviously, we try to recognize individuals that are at risk of developing this condition. Primarily, we're looking at patients that are older, patients with hypertension, where it's very important to treat them medically. Patient post myocardial infarction that can really have reduced heart function and that necessitate treatment with beta blockers as well as ACE inhibitors. We have patients with abnormal valves as well as patients with family history of heart failure. We have patients that suffer for sleep apnea where CPAP can be life-saving. Patients with obesity and also patients with diabetes mellitus. And with this, we have the advance of a new treatment, not only for diabetes, but a treatment to prevent heart failure. And on this, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jason Guichard and the discussion of this new treatment. Jason. Yes, thank you very much, um, Dr. Bouchard. Yeah, this is a very exciting um, area of uh, heart failure um, with uh, medical therapy specifically. Um, as you suggested um, before, um, you know, there are three mainstays of uh, medical therapy, which is the cornerstone treatment of heart failure, one of those being beta blockers, um, the second of those being uh, ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, or also a new um, a medication called an ARNI, also known as Entresto. Um, and in addition to that, malaraliquid receptor antagonists like aldactone or spironolactone. So those have always formed the kind of cornerstone treatment, the big three, as I used to call them. Um, but here recently in the past five years, since 2015, there's been a wealth of data, positive data with um, the SGLT2 um, inhibitors, um, also known as the sodium glucose transporter 2 inhibitors over the last five years. Uh, there are a handful of different medications in this class um, that people may recognize. Jardiance um, or impagliflozin is one. Farsiga or dapagliflozin is another one, and then Invacana or Camnigaflozin are kind of the three big um, SGLT2 inhibitors in, in those classes. 
Um, there's been lots of data, um, positive data regarding cardiovascular outcomes. Um, under cardiovascular outcomes, or heart failure is one of those. And that's really been where these medications have shined uh, pretty significantly um, and uh, have become kind of quickly the fourth medication. Um, so no longer three, but the fourth medication um, in our armamentarium to improve outcomes in heart failure patients with a low ejection fraction. So, you know, this heart failure is obviously a very important topic. It's one of the largest actual stresses on the healthcare system. It's responsible for a remarkable amount of decrease in quality of life for patients and a remarkable amount of resources used in trying to keep people out of hospital. And everyone knows someone with heart failure, shortness of breath, fatigue, um, not being able to, you know, even lay flat, decreased exercise tolerance, swelling in the legs, and heart failure is what I would say most cardiologists is the bread and butter of what they're dealing with often on a on a daily basis. It's such a complex and uh, huge specialty that it has its own specialty, which subspecialty, which of course Dr. Gishard Jason is a, a specialist in, which requires its own dedicated training. And the importance of some of what we're talking about today is for, I would say for decades, definitely since the beginning of when I was going back in medical school, we're talking 1999, uh, back then, the treatments haven't really changed too much. When it comes to basic medical treatment of heart failure, there were some big breakthroughs back then. And the SGL2, the, the, these inhibitors and these drugs that we're talking about today, these are probably amongst the largest breakthroughs since that time. Uh, what are your thoughts on that and, and, and how long it's been and, and how this is changing the landscape for what's such a huge population of, of patients? So some of, the, some of the changes that we've seen um, in our patients, you know, specifically the patient population that I deal with is heart failure patients. One of the uh, uh, main issues in heart failure, as a lot of us know, is, is, is fluid volume retention, either in someone's legs or in their lungs, which will cause them to become short-winded and shorter breath and with the subsequent fatigue and sleeping issues. One of the um, mechanisms of action or one of the ways that these medicines work um, is actually they allow an, what we call an osmotic diuresis. So you're able to get rid of fluid using a beneficial medication. And as the medication is able to get fluid off you, both uh, you know, fluid, um, glucose and salt, kind of three important um, aspects of these medications. This will help you breathe better. Um, this will help you uh, remain more active. Um, it actually improves um, um, both uh, energy and activity as well as uh, improved renal function. Uh, being able to get rid of some of the some extra fluid that can sometimes cause pressure on the kidneys and cause them to be um, dysfunctional. Um, so a lot of our patients feel remarkably better. Their quality of life improves. Um, which has actually been shown in some clinical trials as well. Um, so there are, you know, real tangible um, and almost immediate beneficial effects that patients see um, after being on these medications. If we could maybe, if you could mention some of the trials that have been shown to, to prevent the development of heart failure. So there's been a, uh, a number of uh, recent clinical trials um, um, the, uh, the main met, uh, trials in this arena to uh, kind of usher in this new um, class of medications. The first one is the IMPA-REG trial that studied um, impagliflozin or Jardians. Um, this trial was quite powerful that shown um, just taking the medication over the matter of just a few weeks um, to a couple months, the curves begin to separate um, with regards to outcomes. Um, there were very strong outcomes in this clinical trial, including um, cardiovascular mortality, heart failure hospitalization, and all-cause mortality. So this is one of the um, um, first medications in a long time to come around to actually improve all-cause mortality. So dying from anything um, was actually improved with this class of medications. Um, the other clinical trial was called CANVAS. This studied um, canigaflozin or Invicana, which uh, um, showed similar benefits um, to that class of medications. Um, and uh, um, the dapagliflozin as well, um, or Farsiga. That particular medication had a new clinical trial called DAPA-HF, which was probably one of the more exciting clinical trials in the heart failure world in a long time. Um, that actually uh, broke the barrier 
and crossed over to studying patients without diabetes. So up to this point, we've been talking about a diabetic medicine. This was the first trial to show that this was actually not, no longer a diabetes medicine, um, but actually a heart failure medicine. So it showed a benefit in patients with or without diabetes um, and actually got a recent FDA indication. Um, I believe it was just about a, a month or two ago for that indication. So this is when the medication officially crossed over um, to become fully a heart failure medication for all patients with low ejection fraction. Um, and again, showed an improvement in cardiovascular mortality, um, decrease in heart failure hospitalizations, as well as an improvement um, in all cause mortality as well. Um, there was so Jason, a, Jason, if we focus on the prevention of, uh, of heart failure, um, would you start the SGLT2 actually in a non-diabetic patient, or would, or would you prefer starting this kind of medication in someone with intolerance or, or someone who's at risk of pre-diabetes um, or, or someone who's completely not diabetic at all? Yes, so that's a, an excellent question. Um, so in the, in, the, um, in, prevent, in the prevention trials, these trials um, recruited or enrolled patients that just had cardiovascular disease and diabetes. Um, so these are high risk patients. So high risk heart patients is what we would call them. And these medications actually prevented the progression or prevented the development of heart failure. Um, there are lots of um, mechanisms as to why this could be. Um, the SGLT2 inhibitors are a, a pleiotrophic medication, meaning it acts in several different areas, um, not dissimilar to statins. As we all know, statins are an excellent medication that not only lowers um, blood cholesterol levels, but also lots of other beneficial things. The SGLT2 inhibitors are believed to do the same. Um, pleiotropic metabolic and direct cardioprotective and, nephro and nephroprotective or renal protective, kidney protective effects. The SGLT2, you know, probably in order to prevent um, heart failure, they reduce inflammation, they reduce oxidative stress, they reduce fibrosis, um, they, um, um, regulate sympathetic nervous stimulation or activation, which we know is a, um, a, a forerunner to um, reduce ejection fraction. They also improve mitochondrial um, function and mitochondrial efficiency. So there's a direct metabolic component, um, both in the heart and in the kidneys. So probably all of these mechanisms together um, actually prevent these high risk, these high risk heart patients, these patients with atherosclerotic disease, heart blockages, um, stents, that sort of thing, high risk patients from progressing further into heart failure. So being able to tackle heart failure before it begins um, is actually what a lot of these initial trials have shown. And then as such, even if they have heart failure or heart failure develops, these medications are still beneficial. So let's talk about um, these patients uh, and the treatment of patients with congestive heart failure and uh, lower ejection fraction or, or reduced ejection fraction. Uh, we know that, that we have some established treatment and they can reduce mortality. Um, the, uh, but mortality remains still pretty high. After a hospital admission for heart failure, um, about 10% of our patients die within the first 30 days and about 20% die within that first year. And if you have an admission, you're about 50% uh, have increased risk of another admission. And with each admission, the increase in mortality. And I think it's been very, um, it's been very challenging to even implement some of the treatment that we have. Those uh, guideline directed dose of treatment, for example, we, we have the first category of, pay, of medication, which is the ARNI or the angiotensin receptor blockers combined with neprilicin inhibitors, so-called Entresto, uh, either starting treatment with Entresto or an ACE inhibitor uh, like lisinopril is our first line of treatment, but very few patients are actually titrated up to the recommended dose that was really shown to be beneficial in the trial. As a matter of fact, only approximately 20% of the patients are titrated up to the dose that is recommended. We have the second large category of uh, medication is the, the beta blocker. Again, here the same problem is only 10% of the patients are titrated up to the recommended dose of, of beta blockers, which is you know something like carvedilol or Corec, 25 milligram twice a day, or metoprolol at 50 milligram twice a day at least. 
finally, we have a third class, which is the uh, aldosterone or antagonist, the, the or eplerinone. Uh, this type of medication kind of help control the, the the fluid level as well as keeping the potassium. Um, it, it's very difficult to get our patients, you know, already to the recommended dose. And now we're we're adding, you know, a fourth category of, or fourth class of treatment with heart failure. Uh, how do you actually uh, do this in, in clinical practice? I mean, this is really kind of challenging. Yes, it is. Um, you know, we, we, we have very busy clinics. Um, we have very sick patients. So as a physician, you know, managing, you know, seeing patients, you know, writing into your electronic medical record system, your medical record, um, talking to the patient, trying to develop a relationship, it leaves very little time to talk about medications um, and, and adjusting medications before your next patient. I will say to piggyback off to path, you know, over after what you had said, you know, medications really are the cornerstone treatment for heart failure with a, a low ejection fraction. And there was recently an article in Lancet, which is the, the second largest medical journal in the entire world, second only to the New England Journal of Medicine. That was just published um, about a month ago, showing this four drug therapy, the Entresto, which you talked about, the beta blocker, um, the aldosterone antagonist or aldactone or a player known, as well as these new SGLT2 inhibitors, that if a patient is on all four of these medications, they can live up to six years longer um, compared to just the standard regimen that people are on that everyone knows about beta blockers and ACE inhibitors. So these medications actually improve life. Um, and, uh, you know, so we just make it a point to try to get people on these medications. I think, um, you know, we usually, you know, kind of lead talking about medications and making sure that, you know, we're doing the best that we can for patients by um, adjusting and getting them on these medications. Some of these medications are easier to titrate than others. Um, the SGLT2 inhibitors, um, you do have to worry about, um, kidney function or renal function, um, and you have to monitor that, that moving forward. Um, there's some uh, additional things that you have to look out for as well that could be very rare, um, but uh, diabetic ketoacidosis is one of those, primarily worse than type 1 diabetics, which we're very careful with using medications um, outside um, the, the co-management with a di with a, uh, endocrinologist, um, but it is something you have to watch out for. Um, but I would just encourage you know the physicians listening to this podcast that these medications are really no joke. You know, the data behind them is um, solid. The data is significant. Um, the number needed to treat to prevent one cardiovascular um, um, death or, or heart failure hospitalization is a uh, number needed to treat is four. So just four patients and being able to get derived this benefit. And for all, all cause mortality or for total mortality, the number needed to treat there is only eight um, so pretty impressive. Um, it's very rare in our world that medications can derive that kind of benefit. But we use that, you know, we use that numbers and those data as our uh, motivation to get people on therapy and titrate it up to the correct dosage. So we talked about how specialized some aspects of cardiology are becoming. So whose responsibility is it, um, Dr. Bouchard? Uh, uh, Dr. Bouchard, the patient goes in and sees your primary care physician. And I think we were either discussing before this or, or during this years and years ago, the most commonly used medications like statins were pres you know, prescribed by completely different specialists and then it came to cardiology. And for many of us, um, it's a fearful thing prescribing a diabetic medication because again, that's an entirely you know, different specialty and we have to respect how much of you know, nuance there is to some of that. So when it comes to this um, heart failure and the prescribing of these new medications, particularly these uh, historically diabetes-linked ones, where should this start? Should this be, you know, do you see a day one day where the primary care doctor is doing that? Or do you see a day where the general cardiologist should be doing that? Or is it you, um, Dr. Bouchard, as a general, uh, you know, and uh, interventional specialist, or Jason, you know, you as a heart failure specialist, who... Who's, who's prescribing these, watching these things, and how complex is it when you're thinking of prescribing these things? How many different things do we have to think about? Do you think some of that hesitance is 
to take ownership is because this is just a new drug and it's of course a you know you don't want to get it wrong so you you kind of punt it or is, or would you say it's the responsibility of every cardiologist to be very familiar and be familiar with prescribing these yeah no that's an excellent question um what i would say is that with anything new um there's always going to be um um a little bit of unknown to it um of course we're all physicians are very busy so keeping track of new things and uh, diving in head first with new things, whether it be a medication or a procedure, um, you know, there can be a little bit of delay. But I would say with these medications, we have now almost five years of data and every single clinical trial um, has been, has been um, uh, resoundingly positive from both heart, kidneys, endocrine, you name it, um, these drugs have been positive. So, you know, what I would suggest is that, you know, you know primary care physicians usually kind of defer to specialists. Um, so I would say, at least for now, these medications probably land in the specialist purview. So I would say endocrinologists, especially, as well as cardiologists. And under there, I would include um, heart failure cardiologists as well are probably going to be the main drivers of using this medication. And I think that cardiologists, um, you know, there's an easy stepwise approach to prescribing um, SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, it all starts with candidates for initiation. Um, you know, patients with type 2 diabetes um, with or at high risk for cardiovascular disease, um, you know, usually that are already on metformin are kind of your perfect candidates. Um, you know, generally we would use a hemoglobin A1C cutoff of about 6.5. Um, so if it's above 6.5, um, you know, you start the medications. Below 6.5, you can sometimes adjust their current diabetes medicines. But honestly, that kind of um, arbitrary cutoff has almost gone away since we now use those in non-diabetics. So the, you know, uh, affecting someone's blood sugar is, is generally um, fairly low um, in this, with these class of medications. So the risk of hypoglycemia is very, very uncommon. Um, although with that caveat can be increased with the concam uh, um, concaminate use of uh, the sulfonylureas and insulin. So, you know, usually you just want to be careful, maybe cut the sulfonylurea in half. Um, generally, you don't have to affect the insulin, but it is something you have to watch out for. Um, selection of a drug and dose, um, you know, as we've talked about, there's a kind of three main ones that are used, the canagliflozin, um, usually at 100 milligrams, dapagliflozin at five milligrams, and empagliflozin at 10 milligrams. Um, so, you know, selection of whatever medication you feel is best based on the available data or maybe the um, the uh, um, insurance coverage in your particular you know, city, state, or county. Um, Pre-screening um, is always important, kind of the, the, the safety aspects of things. So I think patients that are, um, their volume status is important. You know, these medications have a small diuretic effect. So being, uh, you know, if someone is volume overloaded already, which is, you know, a lot of the patients I take care of in the heart failure world, we just add on these medications. But if someone is euvolemic or has, normal volume status, you do need to be, um, um, just kind of watch that, watch out for volume depletion. Um, this can be especially at increased risk for people that are on diuretics already. So just kind of be a little careful, remind the patient to, they get, you know, dizzy or have orthostatic hypotension or low blood pressure, just to kind of watch that. And you can adjust those medications um, if you need to. And then secondly, kidney function. So a lot of these medications have a um, a warning for GFR less than 45. This is just a measure of kidney function. So your prescriber may, or prescribers, um, you know, may be careful when the GFR gets less than 45. Some of the newer clinical trials have actually shown, especially with the kidney disease, that uh, GFR greater than 30 is, um, is generally safe. Um, so they've kind of softly reduced the GFR from 45 to 60, sorry, from 45 to 30. I will say in my practice patterns, um, I've lowered that even further to a GFR of 20. So we safely start both um, the Entresto or SGLT2 inhibitors and even milliradial cord receptor antagonists with anyone with a GFR greater than 30 because we believe that medical therapy really is um, that beneficial and we just watch that kidney function very closely. Um, and it's renal protective, isn't it? I mean, you and it is renal protective, so that's absolutely correct. So we, um, actually, ironically, the, the lower the GFR, the more aggressive we get. Um, and anecdotally, I would say that, you know, uh, folks, patients with um, a low GFR, when we get them started on these medications, 
um, their kidney function actually improves. Um, I have several examples of that. So there's a strong um, cardioprotective effect of these medications. As a matter of fact, they have dedicated clinical trials looking at this exact same thing, this exact question, and they've all been positive. So there is a, a definite link to renal improvement, um, improvement in renal outcomes, you know, redu um, reduced transition to um, dialysis um, with, uh, with the initiation of these medications. Um, now, when you prescribe these medications, you know, there has to be a little bit of patient counseling. Probably one of the biggest one is um, genital um, um, infections. Um, and uh, you have to, you know, kind of preach good genital and perineal hygiene. Because um, as you might imagine, you know, glucose is getting um, into the urine and that can be, um, you know, good food for pathogens such as bacteria and, 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 and fungus. So having good hygiene and, and making patients aware that UTIs or genital um, urinary tract infections can be an issue is always important. And honestly, of all the side effects, that's probably the one that you do see the most. Um, but even that is, is fairly rare. So always kind of counseling patients on that is important. Again, we talked about um, orthostatic hypotension, so not getting too um, dehydrated. Um, and then uh, the rare and uncommon side effect of DKA um, is uh, always something that you need to um, make sure that you educate patients on, and then avoiding excessive alcohol, which is probably good in any case, um, but you know, that can cause dehydration as well as um, you know, kicking off some of these metabolic abnormalities that you see. And then I think most importantly for the cardiologist speaking to is just being close communication with other providers, um, including primary care providers, endocrinologists. Um, I always message or call um, you know, if someone has a primary care provider um, and if someone has an endocrinologist. I find that if you do this enough, people just become to expect that. So I've had to actually reduce my phone calls to some of the primary care providers that I work closely with because they just know what I'm going to do. They anticipate my practice pattern, so it's it's no longer a shock to them. Um, as a matter of fact, now it's they, they if I don't start a patient on an SGLT2 emitter, they they contact me and be like, "Why didn't you?" Um, because they they now expect that from me. Um, and then, of course, the last thing is just long-term continuation. So you need to make sure that you follow up closely with these patients. Serial assessment of renal function, body weights, blood pressure, and symptoms. Um, you can up-titrate these medications um, if you need to. Um, and just ensure adherence to these medicines, you know, just like we would with anything. Make sure you, the patients are taking the medications um, and uh, that everyone's on the same page. So when, um, when you start that new treatment, Jason, do you, you see them and follow up like two weeks later? And, and, and what parameters do you actually measure? You, you measure the kidney function, the, the blood sugar. What, what do you do in the clinic? Yep. So that, that's an excellent question. So with any um, uh, kind of medication that alters or could potentially alter electrolytes or renal function, we always check labs in a week. So exactly seven days or you know, plus or minus a day after someone starts a medication, whether that's an ACE inhibitor or, um, or an angiosensin receptor blocker or, or, or um, Entresto. Same thing with the SGLT2s. We check labs a week, exactly a week to assess for electrolytes, um, look for renal function, um, make sure that there are no major alterations there. Um, and then uh, we generally see all of our patients you know, within two weeks to a month if we're adjusting medications or have uh, you know, concerns about them before bumping them out to the three to four month mark. Um, all these patients, uh, if they're on a diuretic as well, um, you know, that'll be the first thing that we, you know, let's just say um, that a patient came back and their creatinine was elevated a little bit. Usually the, the last thing we want to do is, is blame it on that medication. So we'll look for other medications that may have caused that, whether that's a diuretic, <clears throat> a loop diuretic like Lasix or Torsamide or otherwise, and we will adjust those medications first. I think it's very important in our world, at least in the heart failure world, is that we do everything we can to make sure that we keep patients on these medications, whether or not that requires, you know, cutting back on other medicines um, or um, maybe doing a potassium binder, which would be a, maybe a topic of conversation for a, a different podcast to make sure that we stick to what that Lancet paper showed, that we are able to get everyone on these medications and keep them on these medications. So a lot of patients complain in general about being on too many medicines. I mean, it's incredible sometimes when you see people turn up with their medicine lists. I mean, it takes you know, a long time to review. It's like a full meal of medicines you're taking several times a day. So 
one of the most common questions um, I get asked is how do I get off as much of this as possible? Because of course, number of medications is likely related to adherence. And also, so, you know, the more you're taking, the less you're likely to keep taking everything. So what's the hierarchy of these drugs in heart failure drugs? I think you were alluding to some of this, but for, for me that would start newly prescribing these, is it, is the goal, you know, where does this ch- come up against the beta blocker, the ACE inhibitor, you know, the time tested, I was used to worry about that. Uh, you know, all these trials are done. How does a new drug have a chance? Because, you know, we don't know, this might be 10 times better than the other ones, but everyone's like, oh, you have to take those old ones. So that that's one thing. And also, um, are these drugs that should be started in hospital before patients leave hospital? Or are these drugs that should be started in clinics for newly arrived patients? Like, At what stage of the process is, is this all done? Yeah, those are good questions. Um... So as you know, you know we've got four different medications and probably more to come. Um, so the, the the timing and the order in which to start these medications are, are always a, a topic of conversation. I generally believe, um, and this is just kind of my own thoughts and feelings, that I I kind of go in chronological order. You know, the the order that the medications were first um, kind of discovered to form a benefit. You know, I kind of start there first because presumably, you know, including including Entresto, medications were on what we call background therapy. So they were on previously on beta blockers and, you know, at least most of them um, and aldosterone antagonists. So new medications, you know, have to go up against the old medications. So I usually start with the, you know, the ACE inhibitor or beta blocker first, you know, in patients that have, are medication naive. And then we go from there. So we transition the ACE inhibitor to an Entresto. Um, if they can tolerate it and cost is not an issue, then we add on the milliradicoid receptor antagonist or aldactone. Um, and then, you know, kind of true to form based on how the medications, you know, were, were shown to be proven benefit and rolled out. We usually, you know, save the SGLT2 inhibitor for last. Um, again, that's because it is the newest medication. And um, with all new medications, they can be expensive. So we, you know, like to be, you know, cost conscious and be careful with everyone's finances. So we generally kind of lean towards the generic medicines first, but if patients are able to tolerate those and they, you know, have room to go, then we will add on some of these newer medications as well. So that's generally the order that we do them, you know, beta blocker, ACE inhibitor, transition to Entresto, add an MRA, um, and then SGLT2 inhibitor. But you know, I think any combination or, or um, order in which you start these medications are probably fine. Um, just that, you know, hopefully over the course of, you know, a few months, you know, a patient is able to get on all four medications. Um, as far as when to start these medications, you know, there's some great history behind that. I'm sure Dr. Bouchard knows that, you know, back in the day, they used to start beta blockers, which is probably the most common and easiest medicine that we start now, we used to start them in the hospital. Um, I'm sure he's got lots of good stories about that. Um, you know, patients, you know, people believing that the beta, blocker, beta blockers might actually be harmful or dangerous. Now we start them, you know, kind of with wild abandon without even thinking about it. But no, the, all these medications um, we start as an outpatient. Um, sadly, I think in most hospitals, um, they don't even have SGLT2s on formulary. So we're actually forced um, to have to start these medications um, as an outpatient, but that's okay. Um, as long as, you know, most people, you know, get started on these medications, um, you know, soon after they're discharged or soon after they're diagnosed with heart failure, I think that's acceptable. I will say, however, that some medications um, do actually have um, data, randomized clinical, um, randomized clinical trial data showing starting in the hospital can be beneficial. Um, Entresto is one of those. So starting it in the, in the acute heart failure in the hospital has actually been shown to be beneficial. Um, in my understanding is, is that some of these SGLT2 inhibitors have acute heart failure trials um, that are coming up. So it very soon may be in a few years where the, the um, guidelines and, and directions actually to start these medicines in the hospital, but we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Jason, um, we have the, the special category of patients um, are African-American or Blacks that benefit from hydralazine, the combination of hydralazine and isodil or BDIL, you know, for the uh, the commercial name. And it's actually a benefit that is in on top of the ACE inhibitor as well as beta blockers and and mineralocorticoid antagonist. So do we find the same actually? Is there kind of a um, 
a difference of, uh, of responsiveness or effectiveness actually in African-American or different um, uh, race categories or heart failure? Yes, so that is an excellent question. Um, I guess timely with all of the kind of racial disparity um, types of uh, issues that are going on in our country now. So clinical trials um, um, have been very guilty of being primarily male um, and being primarily white in the majority of the clinical trials to date. Um, so sometimes it can be hard to generalize you know, some of these findings. I think cardiology has taken it upon itself to be um, unique. And a lot of our upcoming trials, I think, strive to be 50-50 you know, male-female, try to have a deserving population of, of minorities that represent um, you know, the, the percentages in, in, in the populations of the U S and, and other countries. But I will say that, up, you know, the, up to this point, you know, clinical trials have been very guilty, of uh, not being very diverse. Um, with that being said, uh, we do believe that African-Americans as well as females do drive a benefit from these medications. Um, but probably further study is ongoing to, to really tease out those beneficial effects. Um, but, uh, um, but we generally believe that, you know, regardless of gender and regardless of nationality, um, the SGLT2s uh, most likely have a benefit. Um, the, um, I don't know if you go on Twitter, but actually it's a very good place to get a lot of information about uh, cardiac uh, disease and, and uh, heart, you know, heart failure treatment. There were some very good tweets just very recently by Aisha Cater and, and Shelley Zeroth, uh, who's a Canadian. Uh, where they describe some of the results of those uh, SGLT2s and, um, you know, really kind of looking at five pathways in heart failure, four drugs in heart failure with reduced heart function. And that if you, if you don't have any treatment for heart failure, your two-year mortality is as high as 35%. As a matter of fact, it's almost as high as 75% at five years. If you introduce the ARNI or this Entresto, or you know the acinimitur, but particularly the Entresto, you have a 28% re re relative risk reduction, uh, and the mortality at two year becomes 25%. If you add the beta blocker, you have a 35% risk reduction, with now a two year mortality for heart failure that is becoming lower at 16%. And then you add the aldosterone antagonist or the aldactone or spironolactone, the relative risk reduction is 30%. Now the two-year mortality for heart failure becomes 11.5%. Adding the SGLT2 brings another 17% relative uh, risk reduction with now the mortality at two-year being 9.5%. I mean, I think this is very powerful, you know, to have this kind of a armatarium and a, 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 all these medications that really have a strong impact on the survival of our patient with absolute risk reduction of SGLT2 of about 25%. Again, on cardio Twitter. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that just um, emphasizes the um, really the disease modifying nature of these medications. Um, and, uh, and the importance of them. And I believe that, you know, a lot of the experts in the field have taken to social media and otherwise because kind of a dirty little secret in our circle and even in the cardiovascular world is that shockingly, the percentage of patients, even despite the good data, despite the home run, clinical trials, et cetera, the percentage of patients on these medications is actually shockingly low. Um, I believe in one of these uh, recent you know, heart failure trials, um, name was Victoria, which is a study of a new class of medications called soluble, soluble guanyl cyclase stimulators, or very SIGWAT, um, which did show a benefit, and an actually an all-cause mortality benefit. But only 10% of the patients in that clinical trial was on Entresto, right? Which actually kind of mirrors real life, which again is very sad. So these are life-saving um, disease altering in a good way medications that sadly very few patients are on. And one of the big um, kind of uh, pioneers um, in this area um, is Dr. Greg Fonero I'm out of UCLA. He um, and his colleagues have worked very hard to strive um, to get people to take and prescribe medications. Um, 
you know, because all of these benefits are only good if you're actually taking the medicines. And maybe even so far as halting new medication development until we can actually prove that we can get patients on these medicines. Because we, you know, you know, uh, these new medications go against people on background therapy, but if so few of them are on background therapy, then what does it really mean? So these are a lot of the kind of um, um, logistical and ethical issues kind of in heart failure and cardiovascular trials in general is just really the poor uptake of um, using medications um, in uh, the patients that actually need them. So, but I think this type of, you know, Twitter information and and other social media, you know, to enlighten physicians and to educate patients about asking their physicians about the, about asking physicians about these medications, I think can be very helpful um, because these really are, you know, life changing medications. And for my patients, um, you know, I'd say the rule of thumb, which is true for all heart failure patients is about 50% mortality in five years. Um, That's kind of the rule of thumb. And uh, these medications, when in combination, can improve mortality by 80%, right? So, I mean, almost doubling life expectancy just by, you know, putting patients on these medicines. So just, again, kind of underscoring, um, you know, the importance of medications um, from both the provider side and the patient side, providers to prescribe the medicines and then patients to take the medicines. Yeah, excellent points. So, um, you know, one of, one of the realities, though, when we talk about the same subject and this is something that came up with the recent cholesterol medications it it all sounds like a great idea until you see how much it costs and this is not just for medicines this is for everything from valve therapies to devices and so what 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 seems to be limiting the uptake is just ludicrous costs availability i mean i can tell you uh, with some of those medicines initially when i tried to prescribe them you end up spending more time on the phone with insurance companies than you do actually dealing with your, your patients. And I, I, I tell you, it, it really prevents you from being able to do that stuff. Where do these drugs stand with availability, cost, you know, do all the, we talked about disparities, do all patients have access to this? I mean, you know, there's many drugs where you can go and get for $4 at Walmart. And, you know, I hope most physicians, um, we are doing this where you go down the list and you try and make it as financially, fiscally responsible and available as possible. What's your thoughts on, on these drugs and that? Yes, a medication cost in, a, in American healthcare is a huge issue. Um, this is uh, something that we will not be able to probably hash out and get an answer to just in this podcast, but maybe a different one. I would, I would love to uh, be able to hash that out or to be able to actually have the power to, to make change. But yes, you know, as Dr. Ahmed said, um, this is a major issue in American healthcare. Um, cost of medications, cost of procedures, um, in order to get the benefit of, of patients. Um, so what we have done um, is we, and it's taken a lot of work, you know, on our end, is we work with each of the companies um, to try to get patient assistance programs, and um, you know we've been very successful that way. So. We, uh, um, the majority of our patients, you know, we've been able to get them on these medications um, for little or no cost. Um, but of course, the, the downside there is it, it does take a lot of um, administrative responsibility on our end. As a matter of fact, we have a, a dedicated um, pharmacy tech um, that our hospital system has, um, uh, has, you know, gifted us to be able to take care of some of these um, um, kind of logistical issues and um, forms and connections that need to be made with um, pharmace- pharmaceutical companies to get these kind of patient assistance programs. Um, we've actually found it to be very helpful for patients and have saved, you know, patients hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Um, but it did take a little bit of work, um, sadly. And we're a, a big health system that has, you know, some of these um, things in place that can make things, you know, a little bit easier for us and patients. But you're right. The, the regulations and paperwork um, surrounding getting someone started on one of these new medications and being able to continue them on the medications um, is a big deal. Um, and waiting until something becomes generic in seven years is not the right answer either. So I wish that I had a, a, um, an easy answer, um, but new medications and their expense can be very problematic. Um, but even so, you know, like I said before, you know, some of these medications are generic. <clears throat> And at least getting patients on the generic medicines, which is generally what we do first, 
and then transitioning to some of these newer expensive medicines and then seeing if the patient can afford them or seeing if the pharmaceutical company can help can sometimes be um can sometimes be helpful but not a but not a guarantee yeah thank you very much um i guess um you know if if a medication can prevent a hospitalization which comes at a huge cost you know if you look at the overall you know picture uh, you are saving you know the healthcare dollars and for us also what's important is keeping our patients alive so a new breakthrough you know in the treatment of heart failure and a lot more to come in the future uh, dr jason gishar dr ahmed thank you very much to learn more from our team of cardiologists please visit us at myheart.net. You can also follow us on social media by searching myheart.net on Facebook and Twitter. And be sure to subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss our next episode.